Lord, I come today to thank you, but not for things I've ever mentioned here before. Not for blessings you have given, or the joys you promised are in store. So as I bow before you, give me the words to express my deepest thanks. Not for what you've given, but Lord, for what you took away. All our sinful blame became the You opened wide your hands As a guilty man You wore my colorful You took the death I earned And all that I deserved on Lord, thanks for all you've given. Most of all, thanks, thanks for, for what, what you took from me. Father, please forgive me for all the times I failed to mention this before. I was so concerned with treasure, I went so far as to even ask for more. But you taught me, Lord, what's precious, and it's not the things you've given me today. For their worth to me is nothing when compared to what you took away. As a guilty man, you wore my crown of thorns. You took the death I earned, and all that I deserved on Calvary. Lord, thanks for all you've given, most of all. Thanks for what you took from me. Your cup to the fire, all that I deserved on Calvary. Lord, thanks for what you've given. Most of all, thanks for what you What words, how precious those words are to me this morning. As we continue Christ's words from the cross, I want you to turn to John 19. And we're going to read together from verse 30 through verse 37. Those of you who want to stand during the reading of God's words, you feel free to do that at this time. John chapter 19, verses 30 through 37. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. 
The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he saw that it bare record, and this record is true. And he knoweth that he saith truth, that ye might believe. For these things were done that the scriptures should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture saith, They shall look on him whom they pierced. The 30th verse, Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, and he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. You may be seated. Father, we pray this morning that you will give us insight into the words of Christ spoken, it is finished. Help us, Lord, to understand how complete our salvation is in Jesus Christ. Oh God, all the devils in hell, all the imps of Satan, cannot take this experience from us. Jesus has completed our salvation. And we thank you in his precious name. Amen. In the early days of our country, one of the great achievements was the laying of the tracks for the Transcontinental Railroad. Progress and union awaited the day when the East and the West would be united by a rail running from the Atlantic to the Pacific. In the year 1869, were any of you around then? <laughs> In the year 1869, the track was completed at great difficulty and sacrifice if you read our nation's history. A great ceremony was planned on the border of Colorado and New Mexico. The governors of both these states were present. A golden stake was cast to be used on this occasion. At the appointed hour, the governors drove the final spike of gold, symbolizing the completion of this railroad, uniting the east to the west. The crowds went wild. They cheered and they clapped. And then the news was spread abroad across our nation. Finally, the Transcontinental Railroad was completed. On the telegraph, the simple message was sent. It is finished. <laughs> it is finished. In contrast this morning, the greatest achievement known to humanity took place over 2,000 years on the border between heaven and hell when four spikes were driven into the hands of our blessed Savior's feet and hands. What a day of victory. What a day of victory. These spikes were not of gold, but crude iron that tore the flesh of our blessed Savior. When these men had done their work, our blessed Lord shouted, It is finished! It is finished! Praise God, heaven and earth were now joined together. Aren't you glad? <laughs> Man and God could now be reunited. Praise the Lord. Sinful humanity now could come boldly into the throne room of grace. 
through what Christ accomplished on the cross of Calvary. It was finished, for as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.19, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. The cry was the sixth word that Jesus spoke from the cross. Humanity has tried to ascertain and understand what do these words mean. My friends, to those who stood around the cross that day, these words had different meanings. The soldiers were glad that the crucifixion was behind them. The Pharisees and Sadducees were glad that this troublemaker was finally going to be silenced. There were people around the cross, his beloved mother and disciple and others who were grieving because the purpose for which they thought Jesus had come was not fulfilled. They were still looking for an earthly kingdom and for the oppression of the Roman Empire to be removed from them. What did these words mean to Jesus? What did they mean to his blessed Father? What do they mean to the devout believer today as we look back in time? To answer these questions, we must understand and consider who it was that spoke them. You see, Jesus, the Son of God, spoke these words. Jesus, the Savior of the world, spoke these words. When he cried, it is finished, it was a cry of fulfillment of his three major ministries of prophet, priest, and king. Jesus came in prophecy to fulfill the prophet who came, the priest who came, the king of all kings who came. And when he shouted, it is finished, he had fulfilled his ministry as prophet priest and king. When Jesus shouted it is finished from the cross, he was stating that his ministry as a prophet of God was complete. You see, a prophet was one who had been called and commissioned by God to do a certain work, and such was the task of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was sent to this earth, commissioned of God to do a certain work. You remember at the age of 12 in the temple, Jesus said in Luke 2, 49 to his family, Wish you not that I must be about my father's business? He knew what he was sent for. He knew the work that he was to fulfill. To his disciples, Jesus said in John 4, 34, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish my Father's work. Again, Jesus said in John 6, 38, I came down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him that sent me. In John's gospel alone, the Lord is spoken of as being sent of God. In Gethsemane, Luke twenty two forty two, 42, Jesus said, Not my will, but thine be done. Now on the cross, this prophet of God cries out, It is finished. It is finished, he said. Praise God, he had completed the work that God had sent him to do. His work was not being taken from him. The messianic hopes of the Jews, though wrong and incorrect concerning his kingdom, this work had been accomplished. <laughs> it had been accomplished through the work of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. A prophet was sent to speak forth for God, to declare his will and purpose, to reveal God's nature and character to sinful men. 
This too is what Christ had done through his life. You'll remember to Philip, Jesus declared in John 14, 9, He that has seen me has seen the Father. Again, John writes concerning Christ in John 1, 18, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son hath declared him to us. My friends, no longer do we have to wonder about God, for Christ has shown him to be a God of love, a God of compassion, a God of forgiveness. Even from the cross, you'll remember he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Romans 5, 8 said, He's a God who commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. What a tremendous message that Jesus the prophet revealed to the then known world. Now on the cross, Christ cries, it is finished. For a complete revelation has been given of God. And he has illustrated it by his very death on the cross for all mankind. My friend, to think that the creator of this world laid down his life for you and for me. To think of the God who spoke and things came to existence, a God who, as the songwriter said, could have called legions of angels to rescue him, but he died alone for you and for me. Yes, when he cried, it is finished, he was telling us that his work as the supreme prophet had been accomplished. In addition, when Jesus shouted, it is finished, he was stating that his ministry as a priest was also completed. Here on the cross, our Savior assumes the role of the high priest of God, the great high priest, but there's a difference. Jesus is not like those of the old dispensation who offered the blood of sheep and goats. My friends, Jesus was offering himself on the altar of Calvary. It was costing his very life as he made intercession for you and for me. He is qualified. To make that offering because he is sinless. He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Not even guile was found in his mouth. He never spoke an evil word against anyone. He was the perfect man in the flesh. No wonder John the Baptist cried out in John 129, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Praise God, we're not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver or gold, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Have you noticed all the church signs that have on it something about the blood of Jesus? Praise God. <laughs> he cleanses us from all sin through the shedding of his own blood. As the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 9, 12, by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place and made an offering for you and for me and all humanity. And praise God, his sacrifice is sufficient. It will pay the price for your sins. First John 1 7 reads, The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. I had a Sunday school teacher said, Did you get that little word all? A double L. <laughs> all sin. It doesn't matter if they're homosexuals, lesbians, adulterers, fornicators, thieves, murderers. Wicked and corrupt politicians. 
The blood of Jesus is sufficient for every sin that's ever been committed. Amen? He will make us whole. There's nothing you've done that cannot be forgiven. Nothing you've done that cannot be cleansed from you. Nothing you've done that can keep you from living a holy life when you receive Jesus Christ. My friends, Jesus now cries from the altar, it is finished. Nothing can be added to it. We can't do enough good works. We can't sing enough special songs. We can't preach enough sermons. We can't be on enough boards and committees. We can't witness enough. My friend, nothing can be added to what Jesus did. We throw ourselves at his mercy and we receive the sacrifice he's made for us because the high priest has accomplished everything that needs to be accomplished for our eternal redemption. As our high priest, all of the types and shadows, ceremonies and rituals, all the sacrifices are now fulfilled. There's no need for them because it's finished. The shed blood of every sacrificial lamb came to full fruition in Christ's eternal sacrifice upon the cross. The scapegoat who bore the sins of the people here found his consummation in what Christ did on the cross. The priesthood itself is done away with. When Jesus cried, it is finished. Oh, yes, we're priests unto God, but not in the sense of the Old Testament priests and the priests that are still practicing today. You see, the priests wore robes of scarlet, but Christ's scarlet was in the blood he shed as a priest after the order of Melchizedek. The priests wore the names of Israel on his shoulder, according to Exodus 28:12. But my friend, Jesus bore our sorrows and carried our griefs in his own body. The high priest wore a crown of gold, but our high priest wore a crown of thorns. The high priest could enter the Holy of Holies only once a year, but our high priest, praise God, offered himself once for the sins of the world and is seated now at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for you and for me, praise God. Now the veil of the temple has been rent in two by the mighty hand of Almighty God. God reached down from heaven and tore it down the middle. No more do we need someone to intercede for us. Praise God, we can come boldly to the throne room of grace. Aren't you glad? <laughs> Wherever you are, at any time of the day or night, you can come into the presence of God and commune with Him. And then finally, when Jesus shouted, It is finished. He was declaring that his ministry as a king was finding its completion as well. Listen to this. By the world's standards, never did one look less like a king. Jesus' crown was a crown of thorns. His scepter was a reed. He seemed powerless since he was nailed to a tree and men were jeering and mocking and making fun of him. His throne was the old rugged cross. Yet when he cried, it is finished, he spoke as a king. The Greek structure is that of a victorious king returning from his conquering with all of its spoils. And as he came into the city where he lived, he would shout, it is finished. It is finished. And so did those with him. And so the shout of Jesus before he gave up the ghost was a shout of victory of a king who led captivity captive. 
Micah had foretold his kingship in Micah 5.12. But thou, Bethlehem, out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. The disciples didn't have to be disappointed. Mary didn't have to be disappointed. They simply misunderstood his kingdom. <laughs> it was a spiritual kingdom, not on this earth. A spiritual kingdom. Jesus refused the crowd when they would have made him a political king in John 6. Because he was to be one who had a spiritual reign. And we were to reign with him. You'll remember that Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world, but I am a king for this reason I've come into the world. And on the other occasions he said, My kingdom's not of this world, it's within you. Jesus doesn't want to war against the nations of this world. He wants to save them. Jesus doesn't want to set up an earthly kingdom. He's the king of the universe. He simply wants to rule and reign in your life and in mine. He wants us to live lives exemplary of the Lord Jesus Christ in this present age. The thief on the cross recognized Jesus as king when he said, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. This does not mean that Satan no longer exists. No. In fact, the Bible tells us for this thousand years since Jesus came and shouted it is finished, for this long period of time, that Satan would be doing all he can to take captives with him to the hell that's prepared for him and his angels. And we see him at work, do we not? He's more rampant and on loose today than I've ever seen him before. Because when Jesus cried, it is finished. Our redemptive work is complete. But we still have to resist the devil and the power of the Holy Spirit. We still have to take the shield of faith to ward against his fiery darts. There's a battle raging. A spiritual battle. And you're in it. Don't give to the whims of the enemy. Stand firm. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in Christ is not in vain. Just a little while, praise God. And he'll be coming for us. And what a day that will be. Yes, the battle has been won. The final outcome has been decided. Regardless how evil this nation gets or how evil this world becomes, regardless of all the falling of nations that takes place, I want to tell you something. You're on the winning side. Because Jesus shouted, it is finished, it's complete. And everyone that will walk the way I've taught them in the word of God, everyone that will receive my spirit and fight the fight of faith is on the winning side, praise God. And nothing can defeat us. Yes, say it again, Lord, it is finished. Jesus is now king eternal. Love will always triumph over sin. Grace will always triumph over the law. Life will always triumph over death. Christ has triumphed over Satan. Christ is on the throne of Almighty God. His hand is upon the helm of this world. Truly we can sing together as a congregation, This is my Father's world. Amen. I'm so glad that on this Palm Sunday, we can leave here singing, I'm a child of the King, a child of the King. With Jesus, my Savior, I'm a child of the King. In closing, my friends, 
it is finished means that Jesus as our prophet and priest and king has completed the work that God sent him to do. Have you recognized Jesus as the prophet? Have you recognized him as the priest that ever lives to make intercession for you? Have you acknowledged him as the king and lord of your life? You may say, Brother Absher, how can we do that? We'll turn to Philippians chapter 2. And let's read together verses 8 through 11. Paul says to the church at Philippi, referring to Jesus Christ, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You want to glorify God this Palm Sunday. You want to bring praises around the throne. You kneel before him as Lord of your life. Let him take control of everything you are or ever hope to be. And you'll leave here shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. <laughs> what a day we have as we celebrate Jesus, our King. Oh, he didn't come as the world expected him to come. He's our king. He sits at the right hand of God. And there's nothing you can ever do that he will not forgive if you call upon him. Oh, my friend, take advantage of the lordship of Jesus Christ. Brother Wayne, come and lead us in a time of invitation.